On today's episode of the Pats Podcast, and it hurts me to say this, we're talking about pain. Stick around. Let's be better ATCs. Before we begin, I want to thank today's sponsor, Moravian University. Moravian University, located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, is a proud sponsor of the Pennsylvania Athletic Trainer Society's annual symposium. Moravian offers a 60-credit Doctor of Athletic Training program that can be completed in only 24 months. The program offers online learning combined with one week on campus each summer for hands-on learning with national experts. With the nation's first and only dual MBA option, you can earn your MBA with just six additional courses. Apply today at moravian.edu slash apply. So now let's meet our guest. Today we have Megan Pomerensky. She is an athletic therapist in Winnipeg and is the co-author of Athletic Therapist Management of Persistent Musculoskeletal Pain, Time to Embrace a Biophysical Social Lens. Uh, Megan, thank you so much for being on the show. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Did I butcher that intro? No, you nailed it. That was yes. good. Yes. All right. So, Megan, why don't you tell us a little about, about yourself, where you went to school, um, what you're doing currently for work, and how you got into this awesome uh, topic of persistent pain. I'd love to. So, I initially started my undergrad uh, degree at the University of Winnipeg. I graduated from there in 2012. So, I have a Bachelor of Science with a major in kinesiology. From there, I certified the Canadian Athletic Therapist Association in 2013 and started working full-time private practice. I decided about three or four years ago that I didn't have enough of an understanding of pain and understanding research and how to use it in my clinical practice. So I went back to McMaster University and graduated in 2020 with a master's degree of science. So that's the formal education side of it. Uh, Throughout time, though, I've been a very, very avid learner. I've taken over 45 continuing ed courses and mentorship opportunities that really helped me build my clinical practice, which is called Empowerment Rehab and Training here in Winnipeg. Awesome. 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 All right. So let's dive into it. Um, Yeah. So I I, I reached out because I I found your article online, um, like we talked about offline. it was really good and really helpful and, and exactly what I was looking for. So what I wanted to bring you on to talk about is, is pain, like, like Phil said, right? Um, can you just define pain, um, which is probably impossible to do, right? But just, just touch on some thoughts about, you know, what is pain and maybe what are some misconceptions about pain? Absolutely. Way to start this with a loaded question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No worries. So, I mean, pain is such a fascinating topic to me. I initially... I'd been through chronic persistent pain myself and didn't really understand a lot of things when I was going through starting school because, you know, you have that thought process of, you know, what's happening physiologically, but then symptoms don't always match up. And it's like, what the heck is going on? And school did not prepare me for that at all. So that's where I dove deep into the pain neuroscience research and things like that, where, I mean, most literature will just describe pain as, you know, that classic definition of an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that resembles uh, actual or potential tissue damage. So it's simple, right? That's where it comes across as, oh my God, pain's in your head. But I see it as just an accurate reflection of both my personal and professional experience in that, you know, we feel all emotions, you know, the butterflies in your stomach with nerves, stress is like that tightness in our neck and shoulders, anxiety as a racing heart. It makes sense that we feel discomfort or pain as that emotional experience as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, a big, a big takeaway for me or, or something I, I would really like our listeners to understand is that pain and tissue damage aren't always correlated, right? Like we can have a ton of damage and no pain and we could have the opposite. We could have, um, you know, no tissue damage on imaging or x-rays or whatever studies we're looking at, but we have an immense amount of pain. So could you just talk about how that, that can happen? Yeah, so typically, I mean, I think if we start with acute pain and just kind of getting that off the table first, that's where we actually have most often that pathophysiological change. So whether it's the physical stress, the infection, 
abnormal pathology or some sort of tissue damage that has actually happened right then we have you know that initial inflammatory chemical mechanical response which then stimulates the nociceptive signals that our body interprets as pain which is that natural and expected response right then we've got the persistent pain side of thing where it lasts or recurs for more than three months and that's that complex pain that doesn't really make sense and is often just called unexplained pain because we know physiologically that that tissue has healed right but that's where where i've gone into my paper and my research is that people's experiences and their social context and their memories and current experiences are causing that ramp and sensitization to make them feel pain that does not align or correlate with the physical objective signs yeah yeah well one way um i i've i've been kind of thought about it or, or been taught to to think about it was you know the the said principle right or, or specific mm -hmm. adaptation to impose demands right if our body gets better at whatever we do if that's lifting weights if that's sprinting if that's whatever activity you do your body's getting better at it and if you are stuck in pain your body's going to get better at having that pain response it's going the pathways are going to get more adapted and, and quicker and more sensitized is which is the word I think you used. Yeah. Um, is that is that a fair um, way to kind of think about it or a fair analogy there? Absolutely. I think that's exactly it. And even further to that, we can speak about how your body doesn't know the difference between types of stress. Right? Yeah. Like stress is stress. So physical stress from the injury, emotional or mental stress because you feel the pain that stress is going to, you know, ramp up more cortisol in your body. That's going to cause more sensitization. So then that's where we get caught in that cycle. Yeah. And this, the, all those other factors continue to play that role and keep that pain persisting. Yeah, no, that's a huge piece of it too. Um, how, how much, how much mental health um, do you feel like plays a, a, a role in, in, in persistent pain? Huge role, to be honest. I think just based on the fact alone that persistence Persistent pain is classified as three months or longer. Most tissue and injuries are going to heal within three months, whether it's a muscle sprain or strain, ligament sprain, fracture, any of that. We know physiologically that that is healed. So why do people continue to be diagnosed with a muscle strain or a whiplash or something like that a year or two or four years after their injury? It doesn't really make sense from a purely mechanical perspective. And that's where the heaviness in the psychological and social factors come in. And I think it's just important to consider that it's not biopsychosocial one third, one third, one third. Sometimes it might be purely biological in those acute phases. Sometimes it might be, you know, 50% psychological, 25, 25, or whatever ratio that is. I, in my clinical experience and in all the, the literature that I've read, though, psychological and social factors play a huge, huge role most of the time. Yeah. And any way you can connect some dots for us there with, with how, you know, that, that would work? Just with the, you know, you know obviously like you talked about the, the cortisol, so the increased stress is stress is stress, right? Um, you know, any specific examples that you could give of clients that you've had that, that you know, this is, was really their underlying issue or, you know, this something that you've worked through anything that you could talk about there. Yeah. So mostly I see it with the psychological concerns of either pain catastrophizing or fear okay. avoidance. And that's heavily what I wrote about in my paper as well, uh, which we know based on a lot, a lot of research that's out there that, the level of pain catastrophizing that people have emotionally and psychologically does predict what their prognosis is going to be. And they've shown this in whiplash, they've shown this in post-op and tons of situations like that. And then with fear avoidance, we know that that leads to poor outcomes because of fear of re-injury, fear of certain movements. And then that leads to the disuse atrophy. And yeah. that's the common thing that then people are, so deconditioned they have all this atrophy tissue quality starts to become way way poorer because you're not using it so we get that dense thick connective scar tissue instead of the nice good quality muscle tissue right. but of course it's going to be sore when you start to move it and then you're going to get stressed out and you're going to think that it hurts 
because something is being damaged when really it's that remodeling process and that sensitivity. So that's where we tend to enter that cycle of, okay, now I'm stressed about my injury. So I'm going to baby it or go back on it or just do nothing at all completely. And then we get stiffer and more painful. And then we try to do something again, it hurts. And we just keep going through that cycle over and over and over again. Yeah. The body likes to be in motion, needs to keep moving. Yeah. So now when yeah. you, so go ahead, Adam. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, what role do you feel like we, so this is a loaded question. I'm curious <laughs> to see what you think, but like, what role do you think we as healthcare professionals play in that, that fear avoidance and, or the catastrophic? Uh, catastrophe is catastrophic is sizing. I can't say that word right now. Um, yes, there you go. Yeah, that that one. That's the word. Um, what role do you feel like we play in that? I have a couple examples in my mind, but I'm just curious to see what you think. I think we have a huge role in it, and one that's very underestimated in a lot of clinicians and therapists because how we respond to things as the professional is going to give the client so much insight on how they think they should be because we're that authoritative person for them. Yes. they're scared they're vulnerable they're coming to us hopefully for reassurance and a positive experience so if we're so caught up in blaming you know your si mobility or an impingement or something for this pain when really it's disuse atrophy or really it's central sensitization and we make it a big deal then that client's going to make it a big deal yeah yeah i think even this is my opinion um I, you know everything i'm saying is more anti anecdotal i mean i've read research and taken courses and stuff but just experience um you know like just take an acute ankle sprain for example if you come in and and you know we we know there's some damage there right so the the in my opinion if you did absolutely nothing for that acute ankle sprain you never did a single day of rem that tissue is going to heal. Your body's going to go through the inflammatory response. The tissue is going to heal. Now, does the pain weigh or is, is that tissue now in the optimal state of, of um, readiness to compete or play or do whatever else? Maybe not, but the tissue itself is going to heal. There's nothing we need to do yeah. to make that happen. And I get frustrated with clinicians who over treat things, right? So mm -hmm you have to come see me for this lymphatic massage. We have to do these ABCs. We have to do this TheraBand or you're never going to get better, right? Like that's the message that we send. Yeah. And is that not going to have that athlete or that patient think in their mind that for the rest of their life, if they've ever have any type of pain or injury, if they don't go see a healthcare professional and do six weeks of rehab, they're screwed. They're never going to walk again in their life. Is that fair? Like, I mean, that's the, the reality that I live in or the, the messaging that I feel like that we're giving. A hundred percent. I, you're speaking completely of my spirit on this. <laughs> <laughs> because I've, I've had a lot of interesting conversations with professionals because of the way that I run my press, because I have that exact conversation with clients all the time. Yeah. I, they come in for an assessment and we sit down and after I go through and realize, okay, there's no red flags here. There's nothing major. We're good to go. It's like, okay, you can go home and go for a walk every day and you can do some general exercise and you don't need to come see me. I'm more than happy to see you if you need that support accountability because, you know, people have yeah. self-efficacy and need that support, but it should be an option. Yeah. In my opinion, where if you need that, sure, let's do it. But for the most part, this is going to get better. Just be active. Yeah. There's tons of research out there that shows, you know, general exercise is just as good as rotator cuff tendinopathy protocols and all those sort of things too. So not to downgrade what we do because there's a very valuable, important space to it, but it's how we frame it. Yes. And giving that power back to the client. Yeah. That, and, and yeah, yeah. I, I should say that too. I don't want to take away from what we right? I, I, yeah. I obviously am going to provide as much treatment that I feel like is necessary to um, help my athletes get back on the field as quickly and as safely as possible. But with that in mind, I think it's super important that we are explaining to them what our treatments are actually doing, right? Like if I give somebody like, let's say for example, ice and stim, I'm very adamant like, hey, this is not healing you, right? Like you do not need this stim to make this tissue heal. It is not necessary. I'm giving you this because you're uncomfortable right now. And this is going to help downregulate some pain. It's going to make you feel a little bit better. And then hopefully that provides an opportunity or a window for me to provide some exercise that we can actually stress the tissue and, and get it to, 
again, it's going to heal either way, but maybe heal a little bit more. Um, the tissue quality would be a little bit different, right? Like we said earlier about the scar tissue and, um, you know, that those types of remodeling, right? I'm just helping it remodel in, a, in, the, in the most optimal way. It's going to do it on its own regardless. I might just help it along the way. Is that, that that's kind of my thoughts. Yeah, for sure. Some efficiency and, and effectiveness there. And I, I feel the same about modalities. Like I don't use them that often just because I don't, need to in my practice um, with the type of people that I see because it's not as much acute pain or anything like that. But when I do, I think the key thing to make sure that the client is aware of what's actually happening here is to give them something that they can do on their own that will get the same result. Yes. If I'm using that TENS machine and getting them to exercise, what else are we doing for a parasympathetic shift in their life? Whether that's, you know, some breathing yoga meditation or just going for the walk or whatever activity just brings them joy to downregulate and confidence yep. down for them to exercise. So then they can start to see it's not Megan fixing the problem. It's this is where just influencing my nervous system. Absolutely. I, like I love I like that. that. I love these influence. I think that's a big, big key there, right? Like, we're not doing anything. We're just steering. We're trying to steer the ship a little bit. We're not actually, you know, healing tissue or doing anything like that. I think another big one too is the, um, like therapy. Like people think they need to have manual therapy to heal or they need to get something up back in place. Like we have to stop using that, that narrative that we are fixing athletes, right? Like it's just not fair to them to have in the mind that, Oh my goodness, my SI joints out of place or my, L5 is out of place. And if I don't go see the person and they put it back in, what, what's going to, my back's going to explode, right? Like we They're have to right change that narrative. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what it sounds like though. And it, it, to me, that's the same thing as framing as modalities. Are we framing things as a neuro, with a neuroplasticity mindset of nervous system influence, or is it being framed purely mechanical, which we know deep down is just not true. There's no research that supports it. And there's no research that really shows that we found um, that shows, sorry, like a, a cumulative effect of manual therapy. Like we're actually changing the tissue quality with our hands. It's yeah. that initial nervous system influence that calms things down. And I think that similarly falls into the exercise side of things with people with persistent pain, because if we're framing things biomechanically is like we're increasing muscle extensibility or we're improving mechanics around your impingement or we're gonna you know work that counter nutation for your si to move properly that's where the clients tend to think oh my god something is wrong and this needs to be fixed versus have we helped them adopt maybe that psychosocial mindset and neuroplasticity mindset where they can understand that this is graded activity and graded exposure that's helping them get or not the fixing. Yeah. Yeah. Phil, what do you got there? It looks I, like you got, you got yeah, something. Yeah, I do a itching. lot of, I do a lot of manual <laughs> therapy uh, in my own practice and I get a lot of benefit from it, but I, I do exactly what, what, what you were kind of mentioning there is it's part of it's the, the application of the therapy is what's working, not the type of therapy it is. So yeah. by applying a therapy, a, a stress or a strain to the underlying structures, you are efficiently, you know, helping helping the healing process. It's not because my hands are on you. Um, granted, some cultures do believe that, and I do feel there is a benefit with that, with touch on a human. I mean, we we are. Um, it, it just there there is a response when you touch someone, and if it's a comforting response, I find that it calms them down and it helps your treatment, helps them buy into the process and ultimately feel better, which is our goal is to help our help our uh, uh, patients feel better. Exactly. And the more tools that you have, the better, whether that's uh, electrical modality, whether that's your hands, whether that's a, a heat pack or whether it's exercise. I think that that's the beauty of it is that at the end of the day, they're all going to get the same effect, just yep. the same way that, you know, athletic therapy, chiro, physio at the end of the day, will get the same effect. It's yep. just a matter of how are we doing it and what supports that client's beliefs and values yeah yeah so yeah, and just it just the messaging we're, we're sending yeah. with you know yeah. our, our narrative around that and, and how we're using it yeah. yeah some people might be better with with their hands other people utilize our tools and can get just as good if not better results i i that that philosophy is absolutely awesome i love it so yeah so when we're talking about the um 
biopsychosocial model, um, how does it differ from tradition, the traditional biomedical model? In short version, it would just be the fact that biomedical, biomedical relates just to purely biological causes of pain, whereas the biopsychosocial does consider social things such as someone's self-perceived abilities, their social role, their social support, even things like financial compensation, you know, where people who are on disability claims tend to report more kinesiologic tendencies in some situations. It considers all of those factors as well as then psychologically, which um, I touched on a little bit with the pain catastrophizing, fear avoidance and, and that side of things. So it's really just separating those things out into compartments of okay. purely biological versus <clears throat> multifaceted. So this would be like yeah. your, your football athlete who has an ankle sprain and you can put him through an entire circuit for days on end. Um, he's got the strength, he's got the flexibility, he's got the mobility, he's got the stabilization, but then come game time, you know, he's hurt. He, he's yeah. not performing. It's a matter he, she, um, it's, it's a matter of, you know, there's, they feel that there's something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah their perception in either direction doesn't line up with the objective findings. Gotcha. Perception. Yeah, Love yeah, that word. To the, to the extreme of like they're hypersensitive or they're just completely scared to move at all and doing nothing. Yeah. That, that perception is the, the word I use with all my athletes when I talk about pain is, is pain is a perception of threat. Yeah. There might not be threat there. There might be, or we, we might be getting there or, you know, you know, if you have, um, you know, let's say for example, um, like hand splints, right? Like there might be some tissue that is starting to get overloaded and it's, it's this perception, Hey, red flag, right? It's an alarm system. Um, right. So we can have pain before there's tissue damage, right? As well as, okay, now we have tissue damage. We have actual nociception, uh, chemical responses, right? Then we can still have pain after that, right? So that's all healed. It all went away. And now we still have pain, right? So there, there's, there's just so much complexity to the pain. Um, but I think kind of changing that narrative and, and just explaining to patients and, you know, this, I guess would be my next question then for Megan, cause it's kind of coming out as I say this, you know, some people do say whenever you try to explain this stuff, like, Oh, you're saying it's in my head. Do you get that all? Or what are some, what are some good ways to explain this to patients? So that way they better understand it without them thinking that we're like, Oh, you're just making this up. Yeah, no, I get that a lot. And you know, depending on the client, you can, take it many different ways sometimes it's enough to to tell that client well technically your brain's in your head so <laughs> yeah for that i, I like that, that you know I and if, if i've gone that way with some clients and that's <clears throat> enough for them for a lot of clients though it's also a very long slow 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 process to make this change in their mindset and belief like we know behavior change is uncomfortable and slow and you have to believe in the, the other behavior to make that change. And most of the time people need to witness something before they believe it. And in this situation of accepting this model, it's the opposite where we need them to believe in it before they see the result. Mm. So that's where it can be a very slow, metaphorically painful process. Um, yeah. But therapeutic alliance and how we build that relationship is what's going to make or break it. And we have to meet the client where they're at, not drag them to where we want them to be. Because let's be real with any sort of persistent pain, especially if we're kind of talking six months or more, people have probably seen multiple providers because they're not getting the answers that they need because they're not getting better. How many times have they heard that something is wrong or we're going to do another test or we just have to wait a little bit longer or, you know, that next exercise is going to be the best one and you shouldn't do this or you should do this. Their heads are filled with so, so much that I try to explain it to clients is like, we need to just start fresh and like, yeah. let's forget everything else that happened before we're going to do a really solid assessment here and how I frame my assessment and narrate you know, how we used to in school have to narrate what we're doing to get the marks on the test. I do that in real life, but narrating the positive things that I see, right? So we go through your neuro exam and saying to that client, look, 
all your nerves tested well when I tested these mitomes. That's a great sign. You know, do my slump test perfect. There's nothing here that shows me the disc or nerve drain. Go through all the rotor cuff tests and like look and produce that power. I understand it hurts and there's some irritation there, but you can produce that force. That's great. And then they start to buy into the fact like, okay, maybe something's not wrong here. And then we can talk about it from the, the sensitization perspective. And I find that's the best way to get into that. I love that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of a, a, a story to go with that. You know, I think, you know, we talked about our L's as athletic therapists, like trainers, physical therapists, you know, whatever um, healthcare field you're working in narrative matters, obviously, but um, I find this, as an issue with our physicians as well, right? Especially our orthopedic docs that, you know, they literally only have a lens of like, they have two tools, right? They can either cut you open and fix you, or they can put a cortisone shot in you. If they can't do one of those two things to you, they don't really want to have anything to do with you. I mean, in most cards, I shouldn't say that it's not, that should not be a, a broad yeah. statement, but um, not, not definitely not an absolute, but in my again experience, you know, a lot of of orthopedic doctors like again if they can't do one of those two things they ship you to us which is great but they also don't set you up for success with their narrative right like i literally had a client last night that i was working with had seen a doctor and was talking to me about his shoulder and basically said that the doctor told him you know it's not bad enough that i can do surgery now but you're gonna need a shoulder replacement in x amount of time what would he like it, you can't say that like why would you even say that like what that guy now is gonna have chronic shoulder pain for the rest of his life because he thinks he's already set up for failure right it's, or they say like never squat ever again because <laughs> your knee's gonna explode yep. and yep. it's like well, how do you get up and down out of the chair here bud yep. like come on yep. you don't squat one way in a particular fashion but i mean my I've had hip surgery twice and that was part of what started my pers persistent pain journey. And I remember I was 21 and the surgeon was like, pretty much see you when you're 40 for a hip replacement. Right. And now I'm sitting here at 31 being like, and I know this and I know better. And it's like, Oh my God, my hip's stiff today. Like, shit, am I getting closer? <laughs> Surgery's around the corner. <laughs> I passed that halfway point now of what he said. I'm like I right. know it better, and I know this research, and it still right. like, affects me. Like so, I can't even imagine what our clients feel who don't even have the understanding that we have. Yeah, it's insane to me. Agreed, agreed. Um, Phil, you got anything else? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> what about? Uh, I, I mean, I, I feel like we've touched on it throughout the call, but anything specific we get into on? actual like treatment, you utilizing the biopsychosocial model in treatment. You know, we talked about a couple of other, any other key ways that you, you use it in your practice? So key ways that we touched on were like narrating through the exam to yep. make sure that the client's aware of what's going on. Um, utilizing some patient reported outcome measures. So things like, you know, the widespread pain index or essential sensitization inventory. So we can actually get a sense of really for sure what's going on here from the client's perception. So that again, we can meet them where they're at. Yeah. Um, we have to, as therapists, consider socially what's going on. So are there, do they have support from their family and friends? Because there's research kind of goes both ways on this where some people will amplify the pain response in the presence of other people as a way to kind of seek support that they feel is not there versus some people will downplay it because they don't want to make people feel bad or seem like a burden and mm -hmm. things like that mm -hmm. so having those types of conversations about you know what your life like outside of this bubble of our office like, do you have support at home is your your family, like how do they help you and work with us and help you cope? I think that's a huge one that no one really talks about. Um, and we can use some, you know, yellow flag questionnaires too to guide if we really need to get um, formal psych support involved. Okay. But yeah. I don't think that that's something that we <clears throat> should shy away from. And I think people get scared of those questions. That was that was good in my question. How often do you feel like you uh, refer out or you know? have some type of consultation with healthcare or a mental health care provider and and do you find that people or do you have anybody like that specifically deals with pain like a, a mental health care provider that deals with pain 
I don't have anyone specific on my team for that only because the way our healthcare system works in Canada, it's harder for me to make referrals and that sort of thing. It usually goes through the family doctors. Okay. Um, but I would, I'd say at least one out of every five persistent pain clients were okay. getting formal help with that. Yeah. Outside of that, it's sometimes it's stuff that they just talk to me through a session and get that education and that stuff that indirect route. Yeah, I was going to say how you know uh, if we if we break it down the biopsychosocial model, right? Bio is what I traditionally we all do very yeah. well, right? That that's the the traditional biomedical model. Um, the psycho part or the psychological part, right? Um, you know, how much do you feel like your therapist? How much do you feel like you're a therapist in a session rather than, well, and I guess you are an athletic therapist, yes. but a, a mental health therapist compared to a physiotherapist or, you know, more physical bio part of it? It definitely overlaps. I mean, I have a lot of sessions where I don't do any manual therapy and we do any exercise. We're just talking. Whether it's more of like that formal education where sometimes we're watching videos together that, you know, Lerner mostly, Craig and and my mentors in that field have put together on educating people or bridge jam. Um, and we go through that together. Sometimes it's me literally drawing out pictures and graphs of showing them how sensitization works and threshold levels change. And sometimes it's literally us just talking about their stress at work. Yeah. Yeah. What about, um... and then that's where, sorry, swing it just back to the conversation about self-efficacy and like, I can ask them then, like, are, are you coping? Do you have coping mechanisms? Do you feel like you need more support in that? And then I can either provide what I can in terms of down regulation support to give them some strategies or offer a conversation or suggest they have a conversation with their doctor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Penny. Have you, um, do you do any like placebo effect treatments where, not that you, you, um, offer something um that you know is not actually what you're saying it is but like played out to be something that's going to be amazing when it's really just like effort not as much with a manual technique or or modalities but i think with exercise yes in this so people who are like scared to flex and like i've had it where recently where somebody's in with back pain and I can't even do a range of motion assessment because they are scared to hurt themselves bending forwards to just do a simple toe touch. But then I ask them to sit down and take their sock off so I can check their pulse and they give me full lumbar flexion. So I don't know, kind yep. of along that route. Yes. And then I, I continue that into exercise then where you know, it's not necessarily that we're doing a hip hinge standing, like let's just do a glute bridge. And then after they do some reps and realize, hey, this is okay, then I can break out that, you know what, that's exactly what a hip hinge is just laying on your back. Yeah. So why don't we try it standing now? And I, I do it that way more than more than manual therapy and modalities. But I, I really think it's just because 75% of my practice is exercise only. Yep. Gotcha. I think if I did more manual therapy, I probably would. It's hard to say, but. But no, you're, you're essentially, you're showing that, you know, what, what they need to do is possible and they, they physically can. And it, it, it's a way to convince the mind that, okay, I can, I can do this. This is, this is awesome. Yeah. And then you get that light bulb going off in your patient. And I, I mean, that's just a, a magical, magical day right there. Yeah, that's that's always my goal with every session, and and that starts kind of from some personal experience too. When I was going through my rehab and having some nervousness and anxiety around exercise again, even though you know I saw the pictures from my hip surgery that my hip was good now, I was like, I'm still scared something might happen, and. I saw all the biomedical professionals and um, it wasn't until I worked with Dr. Craig Liebenson that he had me, he gave me a positive experience movement within 20 minutes and had me on a single leg doing deadlifts again. When before that I was literally having a panic attack doing a bird dog on the ground. And it was because 
he never focused on the biomedical side of things. It was the psychosocial stuff and making sure I felt safe being in the right setting, having support and not be torn apart with like, oh, your hips dropping and pack your shoulder better and don't have your head drop down and oh, your leg went too far. It was just like, cool, do the movement, see what happens. How can we make it different? Not necessarily how can we make it better and trying to think what's right and what's wrong, but just how can we make it different and thinking about it from movement exploration. Okay. And that's that. what I've taken into all of the rest of my career. And it, in hindsight, I'm very fortunate that I experienced that personally right at the beginning of my career. When I was in it, I hated when everybody said it would make me a better therapist. And I was like, no, we're not having that conversation. I'm not ready for it. But in hindsight, it definitely made me a better therapist because I know what they're going through. And I sometimes I can just sense that now because I, I think I can see myself in some of these clients. And I know when to pull back and just explore things and help them that way. So I like to call it that versus placebo, but it's the same thing. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I don't, the placebo makes it sound very uh, trickery, right? Yeah, like we're trying to trick sham, them into something. The and, that, and that's not what I, I know that. I was going to say, Phil, I know Phil wasn't going for that. He was just trying to figure out how to, to verbalize that, yeah. that question. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I um, that's my thought. Um, the, uh, oh man, it's gone. Where'd it go? Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, so just uh, going back to like more of the 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 psychological part of it and, and yeah. having those conversations, and I think that is is so valuable, right? And and um, we talk about and you know when when I was an undergrad, it, the the history was a big piece of the puzzle, and yeah. it was it, you know kind of like oh you gotta take a good history, you gotta take a history. And I was just like, I don't need a good history. Like when I first started out, right? Like oh I can do a Lockman, like I can figure this out. I don't need to, I don't care what you say, right? Like I, I would ask them some questions, but I would like zone out, right? Now, like I literally spend oh, yeah. minimum 30 minutes of just talking to them yeah. to get their experience, to figure out what makes it worse, what makes it better. And just showing them that you care about yeah. them as a human being is such yeah. a big f impact. Yeah. And, and anything else you say, like they're going to, they're going to buy in. Right. Cause they, they're like, dude, this guy actually cares. He just talked to me for 30 minutes about the same, you know, little shin splint that I have. Right. So I, I do think that yeah. is so valuable and, and we need to, to just steer away from that, that just blends and really start to yeah. treat the person, not yeah. the injury. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember in school, like we were taught to do a history pretty much as fast as you could. And like, you know, we had 20 minutes to, to do an assessment. So five minutes on your history. And it's like, you can barely say hi, hello, like, are you right or left handed in that <laughs> time for me to actually understand what somebody has gone through. Yep. It, it works in that very clear cut. Oh, I saw you sprain your ankle on the basketball court. Sure. I don't need to do a big long history because you're my yep. athlete and I know you. Yeah anything outside of that little bubble of context you need to do more and understand that person's story because you're right it's just showing that you care yep. that's really what what takes it the furthest is that empathy and compassion more than your actual yep. skills absolutely absolutely again you know the the game ready and the stim and all the modalities and manual therapy all that is great and and, and helps but yeah if, if you if you can't show your patient you actually care about them as a human being I think your, your results are going to be limited. Exactly. And I think we do honestly have the proof of that with the fact that we have insane amount of tools available to us, but yet persistent pain still exists. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. obviously it's not just about the tools because all over the world, we all have the same tool and there's still a, such a high prevalence of persistent pain. So something's missing. There. Something is missing. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Love it. So if you had to wrap up a couple key highlights of, of biopsychosocial model or, or one big message that you would like to get across to listeners, wrap us up a little bit on, on the biopsychosocial model. Look at the person as a human being, not just the injured body part. Love it. That's really it, I think, at yeah. the end of the day. Yep, 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 yep. Just making sure, again, like my, my big thing is, you know, Pain doesn't mean tissue damage is, is what I really want our listeners to understand, right? Like that's, we, we have the MRI data, right? Like I love, I love the study with the back pain, right? You're like, I, I'm just making up some stats because I don't remember them off the top of my head. But like if we MRI a hundred people, like half of them are going to have ridiculous radiopathies on these MRIs, but have zero pain. 
And then you could have somebody that has like a barely little tiny little bulge and can't get out of bed, right? So like there is something to pain that we have to better understand. And I think the psychological social part of it plays a huge role and we need to make sure that we're tackling that piece and making sure that our narrative around the things that we are doing is also helping and not hurting the long-term outcome of that that athlete. So yeah. my two cents. Better. <laughs> I like to rant. I'm sorry. Oh, I love it. That's why, that's why I have a podcast, I guess. Right? I don't know. <laughs> <It's> ironic. <laughs> but yeah. Um, do you guys want to jump into the light of yeah, the uh, takeoff? Yeah, All right. So it's our lightning round. We have four <laughs> questions. You can go as um, on the surface or in depth as you want. We can definitely have some fun with these. <laughs> Um, so first one, what is your dream job if you're not already in it? If I couldn't be an athletic therapist, because this is my dream job, I would 100% be a professional organizer, like organizing people's houses, drawers, your workplaces, anything. I find it so calm and relaxing and fun to organize things. So can I just say that I think if you, uh, your athletic training room, cleanliness and organization definitely reflects how good of an athletic trainer you are. Just putting it out there. <laughs> I have a little bit of undiagnosed OCD that, yeah, I am very much a, an organized type of person as well. So I think that's just a trait that you 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 develop over the years as a as a therapist. So. I'm, I'm more of the uh, um, everything so, has its place at the end of the day. <laughs> and that's okay with that. A little bit, just thinking about that. <laughs> yep, we're gonna ignore that and we're gonna move on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Maggie, what do you do for fun? So besides organizing. Um, <laughs> I love to do yoga and meditate. I am, nice. like I said before, a huge nerd and love to just honestly read research articles for fun mm -hmm. and pull some tarot cards once in a while too. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Nice. A little deeper here. Uh, what inspires you? This one, my, the people, my mentors. So people like Dr. Craig Levinson, um, Dr. Neil Creighton, Dr. Baram Jam, those guys who I've been, I've had the opportunity to work with. They are, my biggest inspiration to that you know they help me i want to help people the way they help the nice help yeah yeah and I'll, I'll link those in the in the show notes so that way people have access to because those are great resources to learn more about this model and and, and all the the great mm -hmm. stuff that they're doing so i will link them out um so last question in the lightning round um so an athletic therapist uh what does it mean to be to you to be an athletic therapist what's it all about for you it's about empowering people to get back to or be able to live life that they want and be able to move freely and not feel so restricted and, and negative about things and just bringing that positivity back to movement. Love it. And life. Love it. And life. I love it. I love it. Well, Megan, you've been awesome to chat with. Um, just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to, to come on the show. And uh, if you don't mind, would you be able to provide some... Um, details about maybe where our listeners could reach out to you if they have any questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much again for having me. Um, people can connect with me through my website, which is empowermentrehab.com. Um, E-M-P-O-W-E-R-M-E-N-T rehab.com or on Instagram and Twitter at Megan Pomeranski. Awesome. I will link those as well in the show notes. Make sure everybody has access to you. Um, and again, Megan, thank you for coming on the show. And I want to say a huge thank you to Moravian University for their sponsorship of this episode. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Remember to like, subscribe, share, tweet, post, comment, and DM. Until next time, I'm Adam Richmond. And I'm Philip Hensler. And this was the Pats Podcast.